Welcome to Real Life, everybody. Great to have you. Welcome Canyon Church, Discovery Church. Well, friends, we did it, huh? Unbelievable. Now, for all you 49ers fans, I'm sorry, but you've won five, right? I mean, goodness. We, we, just, we, we just won our second and 50-year gap. So for everybody who, who prayed, thank you. For everybody who texted and for everybody who, you know, messaged me on social media and said congratulations, thank you. I felt like I was part of the team. I felt like I've been with them for years and Man, that was just an amazing, amazing event. So I appreciate that. And uh, uh, I said I wouldn't wear this again until they won the Super Bowl. They won the Super Bowl. Now I'll never take it off. Okay, so um, anyway, I appreciate uh, all that. And if you don't care about that, then I still love you. All right. Hey, we, uh, we're in our uh, new series that we kicked off last weekend uh, called Anxious for Nothing. And I think that most of us can relate with that idea, not that we're anxious for nothing, we're anxious for something, but we'd like to be anxious for nothing. Is there any way we could possibly get there? And it, just in case you may not be anxious, we thought we would uh, try to figure out where you are on this. And so I came across some, what I thought were some fun tweets and memes uh, that kind of sum up how those of us who are anxiety riddled kind of deal with anxiety and what we think, what's going on in our minds. Some of you are thinking, oh, I get it because I'm married to one. Uh, but just so you know, uh, maybe this will, will help you out. Here, here's the first one. I enjoyed this. Me, it's going to be a good day. Anxiety, it's like you don't even care about what happened in third grade anymore. Okay? <laughs> yep, that, I know exactly what that's like. Okay? Here, here's the, the next one. Me, good night. Brain, psst, what? Uh, what disease do you think we have? Okay? <laughs> Uh, this happens in our home, and then my wife wakes me up to talk about what disease she may have. So that's always fun. Okay, here, here's another one. Uh, pretty much explains my life. Okay, stress relief bottle. Yep, absolutely. Just, to, no? Okay, well, all right. Uh, therapist, are you ever worried that? Yes. I don't know what the rest of it is, but yes, okay? Uh, and then here, here's another one. My grandfather fought in two wars. I just had to audibly practice what I was going to say to the lady at the drive through because of my social anxiety, okay? Maybe you can relate to that. Here, here's one last one. Uh, what I think after talking to someone, we made a good connection. I don't like this person. Your voice is annoying. That's a pretty good joke I just made. Or, well, I just made a complete idiot of myself, okay? If you ever felt that way walking away from a conversation, then you know a little bit about what anxiety can look like. Now, author and pastor Max Lucado wrote an amazing book called Anxious for Nothing, and we're using a lot of his ideas in this series that we're walking through, and it's just a great resource, and you can pick it up on Amazon. But I love, I love this quote as he kind of tries to, to get us to think about what anxiety really is. Uh, take a look at this. It's a low-grade fear. It's an edginess. It's a cold wind that just won't stop howling. It's not so much a storm as it is a hunch, maybe even the certainty that a storm is coming. Always another storm. Sunny days, they're just an interlude. A person can't relax in life. You can't enjoy the sun too much. You can't really let your guard down because peace is temporary. It's just short term so you don't sleep well. You don't laugh much. You don't whistle when you walk. It's a meteor shower of what ifs. Well, what if I don't get the job? What if I don't get the bonus? What if we can't afford braces for the kids? What if our kids grow up with crooked teeth? What if because of crooked teeth they don't get a boyfriend or a girlfriend? What if someday they're standing on a street corner holding up a cardboard sign that says, my parents never bought me braces? You know, if you've ever felt that way before, you, you kind of understand this anxiety thing. I mean, doesn't that make everybody feel better now, right? Aren't you glad you came to church? Uh, just because we keep it real around here, can I just, you know, have a little bit of confession with you? I resonate with almost everything in that. I wrestle with the what ifs. If you're a student of the Enneagram at all, uh, I'm a number six, which means I'm analytical about all the ways this can go wrong, okay? I just know everything that could possibly go wrong, and I think about it, and I've had this my entire life. I mean, how many of you, when you were in elementary school, just show of hands, you broke a bone, maybe your arm or your leg, okay, pretty normal, right? How many of you, when you're in elementary school, you had your tonsils out, okay? That's pretty normal. How many of you, when you were in second grade, had an ulcer? this guy, okay? So that's kind of what I'm dealing with, right? I mean, it was long division that wrecked me, all right, deep within. So uh, I, I've just always, I've just always wrestled with this. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. In fact, 
Anxiety is the number one issue that most of us are facing right now. In fact, studies tell us that women report that it's the number one thing they face, and men report it's number two, behind substance abuse. And often the substance abuse is to cover up the anxiety. All of us know what it's like to try to act like we're okay on the outside and put on our Instagram face for everyone else, but inside, we are riddled with anxiety and worry and insecurity and feeling completely alone. Now, I know that every single one of us understands some of that because the reality is our country is filled with people who are dealing with anxiety. In fact, if I were to ask you what is the most anxious country on the planet, you might think of something that's more in a war-torn country, but it's actually the United States. In fact, in the United States, 17% of the population will have a panic attack this year. You know what the percentage is just south of here as you cross the border into Mexico, a place that is dealing with violence and drugs and poverty? 6%. Apparently, we all should vacation in Cancun because they're a lot more relaxed down there than we are up here. Why is that, that we wrestle with it so much? Why is it at some point over the last week you had an anxiety, maybe attack or some kind of, of a downward spiral in your mind or you know somebody who has? Why is it we wrestle with this with our kids when we look at them and we think you are living in the best time of civilization that's ever been and yet... You're filled with anxiety, which makes me filled with anxiety. Now, some of this, let's be honest, is chemical, all right? And I can't prescribe Lexapro, so I'm just not even going to go down that road. If you need to, talk to your doctor, absolutely. But what I can do is I can talk about the spiritual side of things. In fact, we have a lot of resources around here that we want to provide for you. In fact, we've created a, a website where you can just go and you can just go through our webpage on this and they have a lot of different resources there, rlcm.is slash anxiety, that gives you a lot of tools that we have for you and resources for you and people that can help you with this side of your life. But what I want to do over these next three weeks is kind of take it where Carrie kicked us off last week and talk about how could we kind of wrap our mind around just some simple tools to help us get through the day to lower the anxiety just so we can begin to enjoy life again. So last weekend, Kerry kicked us off, and he talked about this idea. And if you missed it, make sure you watch online. It was a fantastic talk. And today, I'm going to kind of pick it up with, with part two. Now, I, we mentioned this last week, <clears throat> but did you, know, did you know, out of the entire Bible, the most highlighted verse is not what some of us would consider the most popular verses, John 3, 16, or Psalm 23, or those kind of verses, but rather it is this verse from this letter written to a first century church by the name of, uh, in, in the town of Philippi, so the letter is called to the Philippians, written by this guy by the name of the Apostle Paul. This is the most highlighted section in the entire Bible. Here's what people are highlighting. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. And it's almost like Paul knows we've already forgotten it because he says, I'll say it again, rejoice. It's almost like he knows we are so riddled with anxiety and fear and what ifs and how this could go wrong. By the time he reaches the end of this sentence, he needs to say it again. Because when you and I are going through that downward spiral of anxiety, none of us are thinking, I should rejoice right now. This is a wonderful thing. I pray this happens to me many more times today, okay? <clears throat> None of us think that. And so that's why Paul says, I'm going to just tell you again, I want you to rejoice. In fact, let your gentleness, not a word associated with somebody in, in an anxious state, let your gentleness be evident to all. And this is what, what I love. I love this little sentence right here. The Lord is near. In other words, picture him standing right next to you, ready to be invited into your anxiety. Not far away where you have to call him and beg him to come and wait and wait, but he's there. He's just waiting to be invited in. So with that in mind, do not be anxious about anything. Or as some translations say, be anxious about nothing. But 
<clears throat> in every situation. Now, this is fascinating. You look this up in the Greek. Do you know what it means, every situation? It means every situation. <laughs> it means when the bills are paid, when they're not paid. It means when the kids get all A's and when they don't. It means when your uh, team loses the Super Bowl to the mighty Kansas City Chiefs. You know, it <laughs> means when it's the fourth quarter and nine minutes left and you're down by 10. It means in every situation that you could possibly go through, be anxious about nothing. By, but by prayer and petition, which means constantly asking God, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Now look at the result of all this. And then the peace of God. Now think about it. You would describe your last week a lot of different ways, but very few of us would say peaceful. I mean, on the way in here today, somebody said, how's your week going? Most of us said busy, crazy, you know, just trying to keep up. But none of us said very peaceful, very peaceful. I mean, they would think that you're on something, right, if you said that to them, because nobody says it this way. But he says, I'm telling you, if you will do what I just said, then the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Can I just venture to say this? And you, you may not believe in God at all. You may not be interested in God at all. You're just here to do a favor for somebody that you're with, or you're just kind of skeptical with a bunch of questions. So glad you're here. Probably the thing that you have thought about God is not the, the peace of God. You've thought about the judgment of God. You've thought about the anger of God. You've thought about the rejection by God. Paul says, let me tell you about the God that I know. The peace of God is available for you. And that's what I want you and I to discover through this series. In fact, last week we gave you a little card that had the verse on it that allows you just to memorize this verse that we just read. And if you didn't get one, you can grab one on your way out. And on the other side of this, there's an opportunity for you to text in prayer requests and for you to text in, you know, just saying, I want to be reminded. And we will, we will remind you of this verse throughout the week. I got my reminder yesterday, as, as many of you did. Just sign up for that because this passage is that important. Now, let me just stop and address what many of you are thinking right now. I just read that whole passage about rejoice in the Lord always, and I say it again, rejoice in the peace of God. And some of you are thinking, that guy doesn't know my life. That guy must be living in a really good situation because I'm living in a difficult situation. You have no idea what I'm facing. You have no idea what I'm scared of. You have no idea what's happened to me. I mean, he must be doing really well to say those words. Can I tell you where this was written? In prison. Paul was in a prison for his faith and for preaching about it. He was chained up to a guard 24-7, and he was waiting to be executed. If there's anybody who should have been in the fetal position with anxiety, it was Paul. And the people he's writing to, they're scared to death. They're going to end up there with them in prison because of their faith. In prison because they aren't hailing Caesar as the God of the universe and scared to death that they might also end up being executed. And they're reading this encouraged, as Paul says, be anxious for nothing. So this passage is so powerful that we, we've come up with this acronym based on the word CALM. Okay, so we kind of started this last week, and the letter C <clears throat> to kind of start dealing with our anxiety is this word celebrate. And Carrie talked about this a bit last week, that find things that you celebrate in your life that begins to take your eyes off of the negative and onto the positive. But also this next word that we're going to deal with today is the letter A, which simply stands for ask. That you specifically ask God to help you. Even if you're not sure what you believe about God, this is an all skate, anybody can do this, what does it hurt? But try it. And I think you're going to figure out the Lord is near. Okay, show of hands, and we're just going to out you at this moment right now. How many of you are driving around, let's show this next picture here, with this on, the check engine soon light, okay? Anybody got that on there right now? You drove here with it on? <clears throat> I mean, just seeing that pop on brings anxiety, doesn't it? Because you don't know what it means. That could be a million things. It's going to cost a million dollars, too. I don't know what this is going to be. I don't know what. I, so some of us, we ignore it. Some of you right now just found out that your spouse has this light on in their car, and now you've got anxiety. So anyway, welcome to the club. The, 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 the interesting thing about the check engine light is none of us go to the mechanic shop and say, would you just turn that off? 
okay? I don't know what's wrong. I don't want to know what's wrong. I just want you to turn that light off so I'm not thinking about it anymore. And here's, <laughs> here's why. The light is not the problem. The light is telling us there's a problem, which is so similar to anxiety in our life. Anxiety is not the final problem. Anxiety is the signal that's alerting us that there's a problem. In other words, we could say it this way. Anxiety is the signal that's alerting us that it's time to pray. That's what Paul says we're supposed to do. When we're in dealing with anxiety, he says, talk to God about it. In other words, <laughs> if it's big enough to worry about, it's big enough to pray about. If it's big enough to worry about, it's big enough to pray about it. Now, this is where a lot of us just kind of hit the brakes. Because we know people that pray, but we don't consider ourselves people that pray well. And so when it comes to something big in your life, you want someone else to pray for you, but you might not feel like you're able to pray. Because you don't know what to say. Are there magic words? Do I have to stand? Do I have to lay down? Do I have to dress up? Do I have to talk in some kind of, you know, preacher voice or yell or pace? Or do I have to use all these big words? How do I sign off? I've heard people say in Jesus' name. Do I say that's it? Do I say talk to you later? Go team? Whatever it is. How do I end this thing? What do I do? What if I fall asleep when I'm praying in bed and I just drift off? Is God mad? Does he just cancel out everything that I just said? How do I do this? And that's what I love about what Paul says here. He says, I'll tell you how you do this. Just let your request be known to God. That's it. In fact, there were people back in Jesus' day, they would stand out on the street corner and they would pray out loud so everybody would walk by and go, man, they're so spiritual. And you know what Jesus said about those kind of people? He said, God's not listening to them. Not that God can't hear them. God's just chosen not to listen to their arrogance. In other words, simple is better. Let your requests be known to God. I mean, I think about my kids. They come to me with a lot of things that they want. And they ask in a lot of different ways. Sometimes they ask early. Sometimes they ask late. Sometimes they ask panicked. Sometimes they ask with, Dad, we love you so much, which I know is only setting me up for something that will be very costly. And sometimes they just, <clears throat> they just text it to me. Got, you know, Dad, here's what we need. But can I tell you something? There's no wrong way. The way does not matter. I'm just glad that they asked. When it comes to you talking to God, <laughs> you can do that out loud. You can do that in your mind. You can write it out. You can sigh. You can sing. You can shout with joy. You can shout with anger. Some of us are afraid to talk to God that sternly. But listen, God can take it. God doesn't care how we do it. He just wants us to do it. Because he is our heavenly father. And he wants to hear from us. You know, as a dad, I can tell you, I like it when my kids need me. Especially the older they get, they need me less. I like it when they have a need that I can help with. Now, don't tell them that because it usually costs me a lot of money. But in that moment when they come to me, I, I like that because I'm needed by them. Our Heavenly Father wants to be needed by us. Because if it matters to you, it matters to God because you matter to him. So whatever it is that's causing your anxiety, not just the check engine light, but the problem deep within, that should be a signal that it's time for us to take it to somebody who's an expert. Much like we take our car in to be fixed, we take our anxiety to God and present our requests to him. Now there was this guy that Paul was friends with. His name was Peter. He spent a lot of time with Jesus. And if there's anybody who would have struggled with anxiety, it was probably Peter, because this was a guy that was, you know, redlining one way or the other all the time, very excitable and, you know, jumping in both feet. And then this was a guy that was commonly beaten up or imprisoned because of his faith. In fact, he was always, always running for his life all the time. And yet this is what he says about anxiety. He says, humble yourselves, therefore under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up, and this is the phrase we don't like, in due time. In other words, God's got the, the watch on this one. 
not us. So here's what I want you to do. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. In other words, it's our job to cast. It's his job to care. And often we kind of mix those up. It's our job to cast our fear on him. It's his job to care for us. We don't have the ability to deal with our anxiety, but he does. He says, I want you to cast all that anxiety on me because I can handle it. I can handle it. So we go back to Paul's words because he begins to tell us how we should pray. Take a look at what he said there. He says, do not be anxious about anything, (laughs) but in every situation, and look at these three words, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Now, Now, why did he say the same thing three times? Because it sounds like these three things are identical, but they're actually just a little bit different. Prayer is us admitting that we that there's a God that we need to talk to. Petition is us asking him for help, but request is our specific request. It's almost like Paul is giving us a progression to getting rid of our anxiety. You start off by admitting there's somebody that you can cast your anxiety on, and then you request his help. You petition him and say, I need your help. But don't stop there. Then get real specific with your request. This is what I need from you. You get specific. Now, let me just give you an example of this. Remember, when our, you know, if you, if you have kids when they were really young and, and they would hurt themselves, my kids would hurt themselves. They'd come running to me. They'd be crying. What's wrong? Ah, what's wrong? Ah, you know, and finally, what do you say? Use your words. <clears throat> Tell me what's wrong. Then they, they get a little bit older, and they become teenagers, and they, they go away to school, you know, they come back at the end of the day, and you know something's not right with them. And, and so you look at them, and you say, what's wrong? Oh, no, no, no. What happened? Oh, no, 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 fine. What do you say? Same thing. Use your words. Tell me what's wrong. For the, guys, for those of you that are married, you look at your wife, and you say, what's wrong? Nothing. Let me just tell you. First of all, don't say, use your words. (laughs) Doesn't go over well. And secondly, let me tell you what's wrong. It's not nothing, okay? And it's probably you, okay? That's what I've learned in my house. That's, you know, I just start with, I'm sorry. I walk in the door, I'm sorry. How you doing, everybody? You know, because you just, nine times out of 10, it's mine. But what, what helps us in those moments is when we communicate with each other and say what the issue is. So I just want to drill down on this idea for just a second because I think you're with me on this. You know you got to admit you need help. And petition, saying, God, I need you to to fix this or take this, that's great. But you know where I think we stop short? We don't get specific with our request to God. This is what I want you to really think about when it comes to your anxiety and what I'm trying to process when it comes to my anxiety. Let's don't stop with just kind of a blanket prayer to God. Let's get real specific about what we're asking. Let me tell you why this matters. First of all, a specific prayer helps us know where the answer comes from. If I just say, God, help me to have a good day, and I have a good day, I just think, well, it's bound to happen anyway. But if I get real specific about what I need God's help in, then when that happens, I know where that came from. In fact, there's this great story where Jesus is walking through the city streets and there's this guy who's there who's blind and he's begging, but he's heard that Jesus is coming by. He can't see. He doesn't know how close Jesus is. He just starts yelling, Jesus, son of David. Jesus, son of David. And Jesus walks over to the guy and and look, look what Jesus says. This is really interesting. He says, what do you want me to do for you? The guy's blind. I mean, I bet his disciples were going, oh boy. Jesus, the guy's blind. I mean, what do you think he wants you to do for him, you know? I mean, and and Jesus looks at the guy, and I I don't think he's asking this to this guy for his answer. I think he's asking it so we would all know. I want you to get specific about what you want. And this guy goes, I'd like to see. Okay, well, I thought so. Right answer. And he heals him. But there's something profound about this. And we see this all throughout the New Testament, this invitation to let God know specifically what we need. So that when the answer comes, we're able to identify that as that came from God. Here's the second thing. 
God wants us to pray specifically because a specific prayer is a serious prayer. When we decide to get honest about what it is we're dealing with, we are admitting to God how much we deeply need him. It's a prayer that matters. For instance, if I go out in the lobby and you come up to me and go, hey, we should get dinner sometime. Hey, that'd be great. And then we never plan it. Guess what that means? Nothing. Because you've said this a hundred times to people. Let's get together. Let's do lunch. Let's get dinner. We should get the kids together. You know? But then if, if there's no scheduled date, it's never going to happen. And when we go to God and we just say, God bless this and help this and all that, what's that mean? It means we're just, ch- we're just checking something off a to-do list. But when you sit down with God and you get specific, then suddenly it's a serious prayer. Which leads to this last idea. A specific prayer gets to the root of the issue. Oftentimes, we get anxious, the check engine light is on, and we don't know why. We just know that our heart rate is elevated, our palms are sweaty, we're kind of feverish, we're freaking out a little bit, we want to do anything to escape, and we don't even know the reason why. When we pray and we start getting specific about the why, we begin to discover what the real problem was. I'll give you an example in my life. There have been times that I've gone overseas for various mission trips, flown into Uganda, and you know, just destitute areas to work with our orphanage that's there. And my prayers are, God, I pray this trip goes well. And then as I get more specific, I begin to figure out my fear of the trip is not just that the plane lands properly. My fear is about my own personal safety and even comfort, if I'm being really honest. And when I begin to narrow it down to what the real issue is, sometimes I see how small it is, and sometimes I see how easy it is to hand it over instead of this big, huge thing of, God, help my trip. Same thing is true at work. You may be praying about your job. God, help my job to get better. God, help things to go well. What do you mean by that? Well, you know, I really want, really want this new deal to go through. Why is that? Well, if I must be honest, it would make me look really good at work. And there's something about you saying that that God doesn't say, oh, how dare you think that. God says, I'm so glad you were that honest with me. And there's something about that moment that minimizes our anxiety and kind of right-sizes this problem in our life and gives us the hope that we need to keep handing it over to him. Because if it's worth worrying about, it's worth praying about. And if it matters to you, it matters to God because you matter to him. So here's what I want to ask you to do. (laughs) I want you to get specific with your prayers. Not just, God, take this anxiety away, which is the equivalent of, God, turn off the check engine light. Just turn it off. Yeah, but your whole engine's about to blow up. Whatever, I just don't want to see that light anymore. Instead of praying that prayer, get specific about what the issue is and why and why and why. I think you're going to begin to see, first of all, your anxiety level go down but your specificity goes up and you're able to see what God is going to do in your life. So here's what we're going to do. You were given a piece of paper on your way in here. Here in a moment, we're going to take communion together. And during this time, I want you to write down a specific prayer, something you carried in here today that you don't want to carry out for the rest of your day, for the rest of your week. And then as you exit, here in just a few moments, there are uh, some walls around the exits where you can just roll that up and put it in these prayer walls, and our prayer team will be praying with you. In fact, there will be people out in the lobby that would love to pray with you as well if you so desire. But don't miss out on this opportunity for you to get specific about what it is you're carrying around and begin to pray to your Heavenly Father about this. Let me pray for us. God, thank you that you care for us. Thank you that you love us as we are. And thank you that you know what's deep within our heart that we need to surrender to you. God, for some of us right now, it's surrendering our lives. 
just saying to you over these next few moments, God, I want to make you the leader and the forgiver of my life. God, for some of us, it's a specific anxiety or a specific fear or something we've been carrying with us that we need to let go of and ask you for help. So God, would you do that in these next few moments? And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, at this time, we are going to take communion together. The ushers are going to go ahead and pass the trays down the row. Feel free to take out those cups, and you can go ahead and peel back the top layer and take the bread, the second layer, and take the juice, which are emblems to remind us of the body and the blood of Jesus that was shed for us, which gives us the ability to come to our Heavenly Father and ask for help. Let's do that as we write out our prayers as well.